Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media's Contract Publishing. Welcome to our webinar on the business case for ESG, where an expert panel would explore the many ways in which environmental, social and governance, or ESG factors, can help companies achieve their business goals while also making a positive impact on society and the environment. Today's webinar is hosted on behalf of ESG Africa Conference and is sponsored by Envision Advisory Services. Before we begin, please be aware that we have enabled the Q&A function, so please post any questions into the Q&A box. You'll find this on the panel at the bottom of your screen. The panelists will answer as many of your questions as possible during the webinar. To encourage interaction, we've also enabled the chat function, so you can network with the panelists and other attendees via the chat box. You'll also find this at the bottom of your screen. Please don't post any questions in the chat box as we may miss them. Post them into the Q&A instead. Please be aware that we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending the recording to you when it's available. We're also streaming the webinar live to YouTube and we'll share the link in the chat once it's available. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Wendy Poulton, the founder of Strategy Advisory Strategic Mindsets. Wendy is driven to help companies and individuals strategically navigate the challenges of today's complex world and succeed. With her unique set of skills that combine strategy, sustainability, risk, and coaching, she understands that problems require new ways of thinking to reach solutions. Wendy will facilitate the discussion with today's panel, which consists of David Levinson, Head of Responsible Investments at Ned Group Investments, Sitembile Ngobese, Director of Corporate Affairs at Unilever, Ruth Rennie, Senior Director for Decision and Disclosure at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, Kurt Rulant, Director of Envision Advisory Services, and Shamila Sabrumani, Sabrumani, sorry about that, <laughs> and she's the CEO of NBI. I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Wendy Poulton, to take the proceedings forward. Over to you, Wendy. Wendy, we can't see seem to hear you. Okay. There we go. Now I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, over to you. Okay. Perfect. Good afternoon, everybody. And we're so happy to see you um, at this our second webinar in the series of webinars around some of the dimensions of ESG that we are exploring um, and that we'll uh, want to continue the conversation on. And today's one is quite a, an, an old one, really, because it's been one of the questions that's been asked um, of sustainability managers, strategy managers, CEOs, over the decades where sustainability and ESG practices have become increasingly important and are now becoming really mainstream um, for any um, organization. And we are really lucky to have the panel that we have with us here today because they come from a wide variety of different backgrounds. And so I think the, the discussion is therefore going to be really rich and diverse, um, and we're going to really get into some of the issues. So what we really want to talk about is how some of these ESG factors can, can really drive our business models and why it's essential for, to have ESG as part of that business model and our license to operate as organizations. So I'm going to start off by asking each of the panelists just to give us a couple of minutes on what their thoughts are in general about how ESG is now becoming mainstream and is it in fact becoming mainstream everywhere and why they think that is. So I'll start with, um, with uh, Kurt. Would you like to just give us your introductory comments? Okay, thank you very much, Wendy, for the introduction. Um, I think ESG is still quite embryonic in its nature. Uh, while there is a lot of publications around ESG, a lot of companies, that's based on our understanding as a strategic advisory company, are still struggling with getting a good understanding about what is ESG. You have, in general, a small core of very small, certain big companies that are ESG experts, but then the issue is, what happens with the wider operational environment? And there we see sometimes a mismatch 
while you have ELG experts in the company setting out standards, but they need to take on with them the business business and the operational people. So, and I think one of the areas that we certainly see as one of the target areas initially is helping companies with education, setting the same standards throughout the company, assessing the, 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 the standards within the company so that everyone is on the same baseline and then talk about ESG. So I think there is still a lot of work to do for most companies uh, and certainly the medium to smaller size companies where you have in general one person assigned to ESG to to yeah to to convey the message of ESG within the broader company structures. When do we can't hear you? David, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, if there's any sector that um, is pushing the business case for ESG, it's the financial sector. <laughs> so, David, your introductory comments, please. Sure. Uh, just to offer, offer maybe the perspective of some part of NetBank Wealth, so as investors and how we may interpret ESG. Um, I think the ESG term has been around since maybe one of the other panelists might know more than me, 2010 or 2011, and it's uh, typically quite an esoteric uh, part of the economy, uh, but it's moving very fast. Um, maybe embryonic, as Kurt might say, but if I reflect on seven years ago, starting as an ESG analyst, the term net zero didn't even exist, and now every single asset manager is using the term net zero. So in some parts, in some ways, it does move relatively fast. Um, as investors, we look, at, I guess, for companies that are acutely aware of what some of the global uh, trends are and what some of those frameworks are. So uh, The Economist brought out a famous piece uh, last year, actually calling ESG a very ugly acronym, <laughs> saying investors should maybe just slice out the E and focus on something like climate as the biggest issue of our generation, if not the century. Uh, maybe a bit of an oversimplification and doesn't quite... Um, pick up the nuance of the relationship between the environment and society. So our view is a little bit different. Um, but we look at what's happening in terms of global bodies, such as what's happening in the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change, or these international targets. Uh, South Africa as a country, we bound by a lot of these targets. Uh, and we want to see from companies that invest in, in appreciation for what this means in terms of risk, as well as opportunity for those organizations. So there's a benefit to being on the forefront of ESG. There's also a cost I'm not using ESG, so investors won't want to invest in your companies. We think about our next, next generation clients, one that we investing responsibly. So from a share price perspective, more investors is a good thing for companies. Uh, but if you're coming across as a poor ESG performing, you, you could see a vacuum of uh, equity investors as well as uh, debt investors as well. So it starts to become quite penal on your bottom line. Um, if I reflect on NetBank, uh, we're on a sustainability journey. You'll hear us use the term uh, purpose-led organization. And that comes from the belief of actually more societal lending, saying you cannot be a sustainable company if you're operating in an unsuccessful society. So with all South Africa's ales, uh, you can see how as a company, we are so strongly linked to uh, social equity and the health of, of our country at, uh, at a societal level. Thank you, David. Um, you quoted the, I think it's a famous quote from Bjorn Stixon, right? It said business cannot operate in a society that's failing. So I'll ask Ruth next to, to give us an international perspective around this, because oftentimes people will say, um, you know, it's a developed country issue. Um, what about developing countries where we have SMEs and it's much smaller? What's your thought on the business case for ESG? I think what the last two speakers have said is very relevant. The thing about ESG is that it covers many things that people are already doing because it makes good business sense, but we're packaging it under a different set of letters, which is confusing for people. What we have what we see, and we see it, the other thing about ESG is that it looks very different depending on which economy you're in, which sector you're in, and particularly which part of a global value chain you're operating in. So the pressures are going to be different and the possibilities for you to do things are going to be different. But the things you need to be doing are going to be largely along similar lines. What we've seen is that forward planning, looking at the risks that are coming at us, whether they are the climate risks, which mean that your actual assets, your buildings or your working hours 
or the people that you're able to to deploy in different places or what you're planting in different areas of the country will change with climate change. There is evidence that those things will change. If your business doesn't shift to manage those changes, then your business will not be viable. There is a real fundamental business viability case here. At the same time, when we see more and more young people who are actually choosing where to work based on what the values of their company, of their employers are. And that's a really important thing. And it's, we're not only seeing that in developed countries. We're also seeing that in a lot of what we call the BRICSAMs, which, of which South Africa is one, right? It's those developing economies that are gaining scale and where we're seeing a lot of the values coming down from um, richer countries effectively, but that are influencing customers, they're influencing investors, they're influencing staff. And of course, we have one planet, we have one environment, we have one climate. And so being able to being able to adapt to those changes, see the risks, and make sure that your business model is able to answer those risks, that's absolutely the core to business viability. It's not even about wanting to be a good corporate citizen in the world, although that's fantastic if you want to be driven by purpose. Even if you don't want to be driven by purpose, you still want to be in business. In 10 or 20 years, you're still going to have to do it. Yeah, thank you so much. I was being provocative about developing countries because I totally agree with you. We have to do it no matter where we are. Um, and I think that, especially with global trade and supply chains that we have today, it's just something that makes good business sense. And it's if, if you take the principles from TCFD, for example, around embedded into your strategy and risk processes, that's when it really starts adding value. And so... Um, City and Billy, I just want to ask you, because um, you're from an organization, a company, um, have you seen that shift about how ESG is being integrated into, into strategy and risk management in your organization? Unilever being one of the forerunners of sustainability globally. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I mean, Unilever is one of the world's uh, we are largest consumer goods companies. And I think for the past two years, ESG is at the center of our business strategy globally. We are driven by a purpose to make sustainable living um, commonplace. I think this is very um, true story to our markets um, in which we operate in. Because at Unilever, we have a long, you know, believe that being a responsible, sustainable business makes a stronger, better business. Um, so we've taken to different countries looking into strategic impact um, from a social impact perspective to say, how do we then allow sustainability to be in the forefront of everything that we do? As part of that, we are rethinking um, our plastic system to keep plastic within a circular economy and out of the environment. So in South Africa, this can only happen if we improve the livelihoods of thousands of waste pickers. I think later on, I'll get to share more in terms of what we do in the recy recycling system um, so that we're making sure that these guys are economically and socially um, included in the value chain. Thank you so much. And then last, but certainly not least, um, Samila, from your perspective in your recent role at the JSC, but also in your new role, congratulations, as CEO of the NBI, what are your views on this? Um, well, I know it sounds cliche, but I really have to echo what the, the, the other panelists have said, and I think particularly uh, Ruth, um, understanding that, you know, we've got to consider not ESG just as something you look at or something you do, but the context that it is really trying to create and the awareness that we live within a set of finite boundaries. You know, um, Often the conversation is held in the context of risk management and we look at ESG often from a risk management perspective, which absolutely is a great first step and it resonates with existing structures and companies and therefore I think is a little bit easier to, to put into that narrative. However, sometimes what's missing is the context. And to say what we're really trying to achieve and the outcome we're trying to drive is to achieve sustainable development. And what does that really mean? And it's to operate within the context of a set of finite boundaries. We talk about ecological boundaries and more importantly, to ensure that we maintain adequate social foundation so that whatever we do in our businesses and our practices and what we drive in policy and governments and the like 
is enabling an outcome that says that this is the finiteness that we need to operate within. And within that context, how do we then run our businesses? So whilst there's a risk approach that's kind of outside in, here's all these things that are happening, how does it affect my business and my business needs to respond in order to be relevant, also is the perspective of, but how does my business and my chosen business model impact the achievement of that objective? That is a common objective, which should be a common objective for us collectively as humankind or whatever we would like to put that in. So everything in the way in which we organize our economic activities and what we do should ultimately be driven by that awareness. But that awareness often is lacking. And if you think about it, you know, the understanding of the system's perspective should be across all disciplines that we study, be it finance, be it geography, be it technology, that, that should be there, but it, it's not necessarily the way we've done it, which then translates into business models often that don't adequately understand and account for these things. And we're starting to see that change, obviously, in the broader sustainable development narrative around how do you start pricing for risks? How do you start internalizing externalities and understanding that our, our current perspectives on inputs, outputs, profits, or, you know, cost revenue, even our cost line item actually is missing a significant portion of cost, which is often what we externalize. And so I think those are some of the things that are imperative in understanding what we're trying to achieve and that ESG is not a standalone. It's actually in this context of achieving sustainable development. And the awareness is now growing because what we're starting to see or have actually not just starting to see, we are way down the line in seeing the impacts of our approaches that haven't adequately considered these things. So whether we're starting to see climate change impact and climate change is a great example. While we know it's not the only sustainability consideration has been articulated already, is a great example because we started to quantify. We said there's a boundary. We know there's, there's an Earth's adoptive capacity. We know that this is therefore how much we need to admit and therefore uh, emit and therefore how we need to limit that and what that might look like if we breach that boundary. But there are a number of others as well. So climate change is a great example, but also what it's shown us is the systemic interconnectedness of all of these issues we consider under the E and the S and of course driven by good G right? Because if you don't have good governance, you're really unlikely to start thinking about the other things as carefully as you should. So for me, is that perspective of seeing what is it we're trying to achieve and why does that matter to our business models? Because if we continue in that way, where we go for growth for growth's sake, with the assumption that we can grow into infinity, that fundamental basis is incorrect. And so I think those are some of the things that we're starting to see and that starts to change, but it's a massive shift that needs to happen. And the ESG kind of narrative is helping go in that direction, um, but it's certainly not the full picture. And so that's something I think that is important for us to remember and to constantly be trying to understand what that bigger picture is that we're enabling when we consider these issues. Thank you so much, Jamila. Um, I'd like to go back to something that David mentioned. Um, I think it was David, uh, which was when we talk about ESG, and you have rightly said, you know, it needs to be integrated. You can't just focus on one. You have to look at the systemic issues um, and have transformative business models. Use ESG to help you transform your business models. But oftentimes, especially in Africa, I think it's mentioned that we don't focus enough on the social side. You know, it, and it's so important for Africa. So how do we get around that? How do we make sure that these business models um, are not just thinking about environment, which is a lot easier because it's highly regulated in most cases and the governance which is also required but those social issues are not making it a tick box exercise at the end but something that really adds to our reputation and all these non-quantifiable or hard to quantify social issues so um anybody want to volunteer to kick off with that one david maybe because i started with you <laughs> as you mentioned it sure happy to to give it a crack um, so I, I know we draw a lot on climate. I think it's obviously, it's particularly here in South Africa, the climate and energy is an interesting intersection of the E and the S uh, within uh, ESG. So the world is aiming to limit uh, global warming by one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels by 2100. Uh, what a lot of folks don't realize is every region warms at a different rate. So there's a broad rule of thumb that Africa warms twice as fast as everywhere else. So if the world's warming by 1.5, Africa warm by three degrees. Uh, given what is currently being committed into the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, I think last I read was it was north of two degrees. So if the world's 2.1, Africa's 4.2, and it also means less absolute rainfall, so variation in weather. 
when we chat to <laughs> clients, it's always interesting. They say you're very environmentally focused, but if you flip the narrative to be social, uh, you know, with climate change and biodiversity and all the destruction that takes place, the world will outlive us. It's humans that feel a lot of this consequence along with animals, of course. But flipping that narrative, you often get a different reaction. Um, but going back to South Africa, it's very much at the intersection of how we produce our energy and the type of energy. So you'll hear the term, the just energy transition. So there is a just energy plan that South Africa is receiving funding um, from, which was signed, I think, at the latest COP um, in Egypt at the end of last year, which, if you think about, we have roughly 100,000 people employed within the coal value chain. So if we suddenly need to you know, drop coal altogether, there's a social implication there. So it's about phasing it out, I think, is the term they like to use at all these international negotiation tables through time as we move from more fossil fuels to cleaner, cleaner, cleaner sources of energy production, there's going to be a potential labor impact or there will be a labor impact there. So it's all about how at the broader economic level, we look to evolve our economy. Um, how agile the South African employment sector is, I think is up for debate. Um, we we're chatting on, on a similar, or well, not to the similar webinar the other day, and uh, there was research suggesting the fastest growing jobs in the US this decade were uh, wind turbine uh, engineer and solar panel technician. <laughs> so it's also the ability of the new frontiers to absorb some of that labor, but I think a lot is depending on the agility of the South African labor force. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that social issue, and in, particularly in the context of Africa and SMMEs? But sorry, David, before I go off you, there's a question for you that says, um, how is NetBank supporting small businesses? And then also, how come banks are still funding new fossil fuel developments? Yeah, um, I'll ask the harder one first, which is probably the second one, um, which is not wrong. Um, you know, I think JP Morgan is the biggest funder of uh typically fossil fuels or oil and gas um out of all the major banks across the world uh they're about the fifth or sixth biggest funder of uh, clean energy as well but that is you know just a, a small minor portion of what they still do in the fossil fuel space so there's often a disconnect between what they're saying in the public space versus what their lending book the investment book might be doing so nedbank uh chatting with claim center on a webinar the other day you know, funny enough, met with Tom Boardman when he was heading their bank, uh, you know, whatever it was, I don't know how many years, 20, 30 years ago, whatever it might have been, uh, where they came up with a concept in a meeting room around the Green Bank. Uh, whether that was due to the color at the time was probably more the case, but uh, interestingly, the term green has obviously evolved to mean something environmentally friendly today. So my colleagues at NetBank have put, a, put out quite a, I wouldn't say aggressive, but a net zero aligned energy policy in terms of how they lend into the coal sector, the oil and the gas sector. So off the top of my head, coal, they're no longer funding new coal, thermal coal mining outside of South Africa as of 2021. And as of 2021, no longer funding new coal fired power stations. And then I think there's a 2023 target or 2025, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong on the date, of no longer fu funding uh, thermal coal mining, no matter of the jurisdictions that's here in South Africa. And they'll have similar goals for oil and gas I think leading up to about 2030, 2035 to ultimately be net zero by 2050. So some brave decisions because I imagine my colleagues on the investment bank probably earn a fair amount of revenue on lending into this industry. Um, so yeah, that's what net banks doing, I guess, from an energy perspective. And I can't talk on behalf of our competitors. Some of them are more progressive than others. Um, in terms of small enterprises, sorry, I don't want to take up too much airtime here. Um, you know, when I chat with my colleagues in the bank, um, They've started to introduce uh, sustainability uh, linked loans, as an example. So if you're lending to an organization, it'll be linked to positive ESG outcomes, and that can actually affect the, the preferential treatment of that loan um, and what your payback may, might be. So that's just one example of maybe how they're working with small and medium-sized enterprises. Thank you so much. Uh, Ruth, you had your hand up to answer a question on the Africa. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really important to look at what is it that characterizes African countries' economies. And there's two really important things. One is that they tend to be commodity producing rather than manufacturing based. So you have an enormous amount of raw materials that are produced in a relatively small sector for doing the transformation. And that means, this is the second one, is that compared to other parts of the world, in which labor is expensive and capital is cheap. In Africa, it's exactly the reverse. 
actually labor is cheap and capital is expensive. So it's very labor intensive, but this is the advantage that Africa has. And therefore your social, a lot of the social piece of the ESG that African businesses need to be focusing on are not just your current labor force, but your potential labor force. So it is about skilling up your labor force. It is about doing local sourcing of all of those things that you're importing from other countries to run your business, to run your mine, to run your shop, to run your factory, to run your whatever, that you could be sourcing locally because the more you put that money into your local economy, the more you raise the buying power in your local economy, which will then upskill your potential workforce. It will increase your market locally. And it will therefore support the viability of your business long term. It's the same thing if you're buying agricultural commodities from farmers and you are you need to be investing in their livelihoods. It's the same thing that Titambili said. If we don't manage the livelihoods of our waste pickers, we're going to continue to have a problem because there'll be social unrest. You won't have license to operate the labor piece. And through that, the bigger social impact on local economies, local sourcing upskilling, equality, gender equality, very big one in, in Africa. All of these things, that's that's the S in ESG. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a different thing that's an S over here. That's what we're talking about. And those are all absolutely critical to the way your business will be viable. So again, this is where I come back to say, it isn't just about, it's not an esoteric thing. It's a real thing that affects the way that you do business. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on this? Uh, um, Kurt? Okay. Oh, sorry, Sitimbila, you, you had yes, your hand up and then I had you dropped it. Up, Please yes. go ahead. Oh, no, I thought maybe you would see it. I just wanted to add to say, you know, um, it's very critical. I mean, I was fortunate enough to be part of the COP17 when COP came into the country. And uh, I worked with a lot of young people um, leading the conversation. And I felt like a lot of our young people didn't even understand what climate change was. And throughout my career as part of my dissertation, I looked into the issue of agriculture, which has a big impact, um, in, in, you know, from a climate, from, from livelihoods perspective. Um, Ruth has touched on um, the, the farmers as well. I think it's very important from a South African Africa perspective to look into a social innovative ecosystem that speaks to the agriculture full value chain. Um, what do I mean? I mean, for instance, we've started a project in um, Josini where we've identified 40 young people farmers that we, they're going to get an off-take agreement from Unilever, correct? And this is a farm, that huge farm supported by government, uh, which has been with their parents and their great-grandparents. So it's a continuation. But as we move in, our intention shouldn't only be localization. It's huge. It's good. But how are we going to make sure that the businesses, their businesses are sustainable? And you, when you speak on, um, on climate change, for that matter, what is it as um, corporate and government doing to make sure that we're preparing them? Because what they will tell you is, we know we see this drought, we see some of our, our kettles or animals are dying, but we don't understand what's happening. So I think it's very, from an African perspective, it's very critical at the moment that as we go in from for ESG or whatever social impact innovation project that we're looking into needs to speak holistically to how are we making the, the, the beneficiaries on the ground sustainable and uh, you know, to, 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 to get them ready for issues of climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Good, you had your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to add to a point that Ruth made uh, around the African youth. I mean, by 2050, Africa will be the biggest employment market in, in, in the world with, with more than a, a billion people, of which a lot of them will be youth. So we need to, from a social perspective, and that's also looking at risk, but maybe in 10, 15, 20 years, to reduce the social unrest potential in Africa, we need to start thinking about how can we employ all that youth that comes into the labor market. We already have a lot of unemployment in South Africa with 35% of which the majority is youth that will never have a job. 
and that's sitting there at home thinking in the emptiness maybe looking at twitter and doing whatever but it's it's a big potential danger for the total sustainability of any company not only in south africa but also in 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 africa and i think i'm, I'm currently on holiday in 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 belgium and when i see that around uh, the immigration streams that come from africa european countries also need to do something around work in africa because complaining and trying to limit the stream will not help because these people need have needs they need jobs they need food they need yeah they need to live so i think that's a big uh, element on the s um, on on the s from esg for africa so i think we we shouldn't take that lightly thank you Chris. samila Thanks, Wendy. So, yeah, I completely concur with Kurt. I think the, the thing is that, uh, and I'm going to give a slightly different angle on this. One of the things that we know we're going to be quite in need of to enable the just transition, and remember the just element of transition is really that social context, right? Um, and, this, and the skills transitioning that needs to happen is that we're dependent on a lot of finance to come in from other markets to help us do the transition that we need to, to, to do as a country and you know as a continent as well and get there. How we position and how we articulate our narrative and hold our own story as a country in South Africa, as a continent in Africa, is going to be critically important because there are inherent biases, I think, in some of funding that comes through that's informed by a different reality to the context in which we exist and operate. And so if we want that money to match our need, we need to clearly articulate what those needs are. If you just look at South Africa at this point, 46% unemployment in the expanded definition and up to 80% in certain areas just in the youth sector. To Kurt's point, that is a time bomb, a ticking time bomb, right? Um, youth restlessness should be keeping us all awake at night. Um, and pardon the pun, but that is really what we need to think about. And so when we look at what we need to finance, we need to also understand that there are certain things that as business, for example, we're going to have to lean in on immediately. 46% unemployment is not waiting for the transition to the green economy and the rescaling of the 100,000 people you know, sitting in the coal value chain. This is an issue for the entire country. What do we do now? What do we do in the medium term? And yes, in the longer term. So there's an integration of understanding the challenges that we have right now and needing to know that we've got to do things to address those, but also the longer term, which is aligning that with the transition of the economy that needs to happen anyway, because that's in the context of sustainable development. We've accepted it's something that around the globe we need to work toward. So I think with Africa, it's bringing together of those two things in a different way that is going to be critically important in understanding that social context. And there again, I'm going to reiterate, it's owning our story. And so when we're looking at the financing, even not just climate financing, for example, but international investment, FDI, into our economies, is going to need to understand how we need to position that money, what it needs to actually enable in terms of economic growth, but also social stability. And so that is going to be critically important. And I think that's a responsibility across the board for business as well, to work together very clearly, to articulate that, to understand that, but to also make its own effort to ensure that it promotes that change that is required. Because again, you know, the point was made earlier that business can't thrive in a society that is failing, that is clear. And so those are things I think on the particularly social context is our opportunity, but also our challenge to clearly articulate what we need. And some of those transitions are not going to be financed by, for example, the current glut of debt financing that is likely to come into the country. Because there are certain things you need to do to transition on a social context that are not revenue generating enough to sustain a debt repayment, but are going to be a different kind of financing, a different kind of support that's required. So I won't belabor that point, but really I think there are other touch points that we need to consider from a broader economic transformation perspective that has a serious social implication um, that is very, very real and that will lead to ultimately economic failure if we don't address. Mm. No, thank you, Shamila. I think those are all excellent points. And, um, the South African National Energy Association recently re released a skills roadmap for South Africa for energy. And in there, we say pretty much that, that you've got to also think about these other issues. It's, it's inter this integration that you can't just have renewable energy skills. You have to have 
financial skills. You have to have negotiation skills with that people can talk to communities on. You have to have procurement skills. You know, you have to have all these different issues, and it's so important to look at it holistically. Um, but there's a there's a question, or there are a couple of questions that um, have come up on the chat box. If I can just summarize them, I think. We know that um, these ES and G uh, elements are oftentimes in conflict with each other and in tension with each other. And um, how do we make the business case for ESG, but at the same time make sure that we have equal, but also reasonable and that um, focus on certain areas. So one of the questions was during load shedding, the environmental uh, considerations from coal-fired power stations are being left by the wayside because we need the electricity right now. Um, and that's deemed to be more important. So how do you factor that kind of sort of trade-off into this business case for sustainable development? Anyone want to take a bash at that? Wendy, I can do <laughs> Shamila, yes. Uh, a quick step is that, uh, Definitely in the short term, energy security is, is the priority, right? And there are a huge number of interdependencies on that, but we shouldn't lose sight of the goal in the longer term. It shouldn't be abandon everything for now. It should still be, yes, we've got to focus on the short term energy security now and hope that that, but we need to make sure that, that our plan for the longer term hasn't abandoned the environmental considerations. So I think that's my quick and dirty uh, part in the pun. But I mean, it's a similar thing as we saw in Europe, right? Suddenly we have the issue with Ukraine, Russia, and then we kind of abandon some of the plans and long-term transition to renewables in favor of short-term energy security. And it's not dissimilar in that way. So I think that the, the, the need is to say, yes, short-term energy security, but we have to have that long-term plan that supports the transition. Thank you. And I think that's so important that then your strategy is agile, right? So that you can shift with these and then people don't say, oh, you see, ESG doesn't work. We've had to do something that goes against the principles, but it's really about how you integrate it. So thanks for that, Shamila. Kurt, do you want to add? Yeah, I want to add on Shamila's point. I think it's sometimes an incentivization point, having no electricity from ESCOM, because we are talking to a number of companies currently, and the one is in the steel sector. Um, and one of their big issues is, of course, energy security. So while you can say we can, from a national perspective, there is still debate around coal, five plants and, and, and gas and, and all that stuff. <laughs> For that company in particular, there's a big opportunity to already reduce their energy that they have from ESCOM Via PPAs and David is an expert or his bank is an expert in, in renewable energy financing. So I leave that over to him. But to, to, to use that as an incentivization and as a motivator to move this, to move this, to do this move much faster than it would be normally if there wasn't so much pressure on the grid. So some it, it helps that you have issues like ESCOM. Makes you innovative. <laughs> yes, makes you innovative, correct. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just pick up on a couple of things that you guys mentioned around what is this if you have to you have to convince decision makers, obviously in your organization, not to make ESG a, a, an add-on, but to integrate it into your strategy and that it can um, you know, it is important for your business case. What are the different leadership styles that we need in terms of this? And this really fascinates because I'm also a coach. So I'm fascinated with how people take decisions and what are some of the biases and things that you need to work with in order to get them to take different decisions. Um, so what are the different leadership models we need for, for really making leadership quickly see the benefit of um, ESG um, and the business case for it, but also to get other in the others in the organization to follow suit. <clears throat> so Timbile, do you want to perhaps just talk about your experience in Unilever? What have you seen? Because Unilever had that great leadership from the beginning. Is it a is it a company culture thing? 
how are I think people that don't comply dealt with? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, um, this has been our vision to be the global leader in sustainable business, as I said, and to demonstrate how um, a purpose led future fit business drive um, superior performance. So as part of our um, our responsibility as different departments when we uh, craft our strategy, this becomes part of what we do. And we are led um, by the three objectives globally that uh, brands with purpose grow, companies with purpose last and people with purpose um, thrive. So this has been what has made Unilever so dynamic when it comes to sustainability and the ENS because everything that we do is driven by the purpose, I think you can go as back as um, 100 years ago when we were um, we, we had a first factory in the country where in Maidenhof we did sunlight and sunlight was purely um, developed by a, a founder to fight diseases um, in the world. So each and every program, I think uh, our R&D department is quietly linked to all our brands, all everything that we do. So I think I'm one. we are one of those organizations that it's not an add-on or to say, okay, from a reputational risk perspective, what is it that we're doing when it comes to ESG or sustainability? This is part of what makes Unilever um, the, bigger, the bigger company that it is today. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on leadership styles that would be different? Ruth. One thing that we have seen is a real change in exactly what you're talking about, leadership styles. What you, the, the problem with addressing ESG issues is they are incredibly broad and you require a number of perspectives to actually understand what the risks are, which means that a single leader cannot hold that many perspectives and that much information in a single brain. So that hierarchical top down I'm the leader I decide because I know to address these kinds of complex issues it doesn't work and that's tremendously challenging in cultures across the world which are used to having hierarchical leadership where everything comes from the top down so what we are seeing now is leadership which is much more focused on listening on actually engaging with a whole lot of different stakeholders to find out what the risks are to understand what do our customers need what do our suppliers need what do what do our, what does my staff need to what do our investors need what do regulators need so that this business can thrive because if i don't understand those things then i won't be able to address them and that will be a risk to me down the line and the other piece is then also to be more innovative because again you're running an organization in a particular way, it's very hard for you to come and have an idea to change things dramatically. But there are pockets of understanding and innovation within organizations. And the more you can devolve decision-making to those people who can really understand the business and say, why don't we do it differently? Why don't we do it this way? You know, I've seen in my processes that we could skip these three steps or we could use another simple program and do things much more effectively. And very often it's frontline staff who are actually understanding better how things could be done well. So it is a real shift from the leader is the person who knows and decides and understands everything to this is a collective organizational you know, effort to make things evolve in the direction that we need to evolve them in. The world is just too complex to do it on your own anymore. Yeah, thank you, David. You had your hand up. Yeah, I saw maybe it ties in. I think uh, maybe I've been embarrassed to say I just saw the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> Someone asking about governance, which I'm glad popped up. It's often the uh, the least uh, sexy of the ESG <laughs> acronym. And maybe it ties a little bit into this question. And I've got a sneaky suspicion my logic's going to lead us to saying we need more female leaders and presidents. But <laughs> um, through the eyes of investors, you know, when you look for good leadership, you, you, you'd you love to be a fly on a wall in a boardroom and understanding the sincerity and authenticity of leadership. So we have to take guidance because we can't do that from certain uh, guidelines, uh, such as the king, king codes for corporate governance here in South Africa. You know, South African investors are scarred by recent events. Uh, Steinhoff is a, is a classic example and don't need to go too much into the details, but there are a lot of sort of governance red flags that came through. 
And asset managers at the start of the ESG journeys would often focus on the governance. Um, there's this loosely agreed sort of consensus that strong governance often needs to strong environment on social management. And I don't know if that's been dispelled or if anyone disagrees. Um, so, you know, we, we look for companies there where we can kind of gauge the authenticity of leadership, but then you get organizations such as, you know, the, the you know, Richemont and, you know, the Rupert family where they might not be aligning with King Codes and corporate governance, but investors seek comfort in the fact that there's family and sentimental attachment to the company and there's more of a long-term things than maybe a CEO who comes in for five years and then leaves. So um, it's about weighing it up and the word context has been used a fair amount today. Um, so another thing that we look at, because we do try to simplify it um, within NetBank and Wealth, is around diversity and inclusion as well. So if we go through portfolios with a fine-tooth comb and you look at the CFO and the CEO of listed companies in South Africa, it makes for quite scary reading in terms of uh, just lack of uh, gender representation. So for anyone who's interested within global asset management, there's something called the 30% Club, where uh, investors or at least encouraged to target 30% uh, female representation on a board. So I think anthropological studies suggest that once a minority group has 30% representation, they feel uh, they have a voice that's heard within a boardroom. And it's all of those different ideas coming together and we speak about cognitive diversity as well. And you're looking for leadership that can show that ability to, to think differently. Um, Shamila mentioned, you know, leveraging other skill sets, not having your own blind spots as an individual, um, so the modern day leader is someone who I guess is open uh, to that feedback loop that may have historically been the case. Uh, so yeah, that's something we look at companies is through the lens of diversity. Uh, do they have diversity policies in place? Is there sufficient representation from all different groups of society, et cetera? Thank you. I mean, that's something I follow quite a lot as well. And I think it's not just diversity, it's also inclusion side of things, which is then listening to those d diverse views and having them have a voice at the table. Um, and that's a leadership issue as well about whether you actually take cognizance of those things. Camila, you had your hand up. Um, yes, Wendy, sorry, just to, to continue on that theme, um, once you, you actually, in a way, almost ticking the boxes, right? Because if that's where you start, that's where you start. But you should see the benefit of that start to filter through in how it impacts strategy and how it impacts the diversity and thinking, you know, the cognitive diversity in the room. So, it, you know, sometimes you might just start, oh, my goodness, I just need to do this ESG thing, right? And everyone tick the box. But even if that's where you start, which ideally you shouldn't, you should do it because, you know, you know that this is the, the way it, it, it's actually going to have an impact in the business. But if you get there and those impacts filter through and you've got the right people in the room, it should create that enabling environment for these changes to take root. Because hopefully you're going to get that that view in the room. Just on leadership in particular, Wendy, I just want to pause on that. I think that given the nascent stage we are in some instances, and yes, some companies are far further down the line than others are, um, a leader who walks that chalk, so to speak, and who is continually making sure that they make it clear in the organization that we need to consider these things and has helped to create the structures in the organization that facilitate the dialogue that facilitate the integration into strategy is absolutely critical. And so that leader constantly saying this needs to be done and holding people to account for it is really instrumental in that change. And it's not always an easy thing to do because we're still sitting in a situation where uh, what we're measured on in terms of success, right, as CEOs or whatever, often is a very narrow definition um, and on profitability, on return on equity, on things like that. And so keeping those things golden in an organization usually is the driving factor. And often the factors that we're looking at on sustainability are not necessarily immediately obvious to the bottom line. In some cases it is, in other cases it isn't, and it might take a longer term perspective. So I think the acknowledgement by the leader that this is a journey we need to do this and has the structures and systems in place to support his intent and the strategy is critically important. And to make sure that is continually reiterated and finding the mechanisms to get everybody on board, however that might be, is critical. Because again, to Ruth's point, I mean, this is not, it's not something that one person can hold in their head. As an ex-chief sustainability officer, I completely concur with that. You cannot be an expert on everything. You really need to get the wisdom of the crowd and the village. And um, so those, I think, are, are critical elements for a leader to acknowledge. If I go back and I just think about the JSC's example, I mean, the JSC was effectively considered a leader in stock exchanges going as far back as 2002, 2004, 
before sustainability was a thing, you know. But it took the deputy CEO at the time who held the agenda tight to make sure that it stayed in the conversation all the time. Because the criticism always is, well, if there's not making us money, why are we doing this, you know? And that might not be the immediate relation to the bottom line. But saying it's important and this is why and making the long-term case and ensuring that it is held on the agenda was critical in ensuring that it had the time it needed to start infiltrating to the impact that it's had on the market now in terms of the way the JSC strategy has been able to unfold over time. And so I'm using that as an example because it was a reflection on leadership and it was a reflection on long-termism and on understanding that the mechanisms within the organization need to be there to try to ensure that that narrative takes root and becomes the groundswell that you really need to sustain sustain it in the longer term and not easily swap it out for a short-term perspective. Thank you. I was on that original advisory committee for Nikki and she went through a tough time. <laughs> I really admired her, so she had to fight hard for that. Um, Okay, so I think the next question I'd sort of like to get to is almost around, um, well, somebody has asked a question around greenwashing. And it also, you've raised it now, Shamila, you talk about short-term versus long-termism. We're talking about it with energy security just now. Um, oftentimes, the tenure of the, um, the CEO is short, and they can, you know, we've seen it fiddle figures to make sure that they look good. And then we lose this long-term vision, which is so essential to, to ESG in general. How do we get around that um, in making the business case that you, a part of the business case is doing those things that are gonna be longer term. It may require longer periods of funding or slower to start up, et cetera. Bert, can I perhaps start with you on that one? Okay. And then all the greenwashing ultimately here. Yeah. Yes. I think in my opening remarks, I spoke about bringing everyone in the company at the same level. And that also means at the board. To, because the board in, is the ultimate guider, guidance uh, of the long term strategy. Because CEOs come and, and go. And I have a very interesting and practical example of a CEO of a JSE listed company who we, who we were in a meeting with. And he said, look, I can say everything around 2030. I can set the fantastic targets, but by 2030, I'm retired. But the board should be the main uh, government's institution to take these strategies and, and targets long term forward. And once you have a board that's aligned and then can cascade it through through the different levels and educate everyone and implement it in the business, like Shamila said, it needs to be inter internalized in the business operation so that it's not becoming something that expert A on E or expert A on S is saying, but business is doing that. But that takes a long, long, it's a change management process. It's a trans process. Like like every big change management process is, is 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 so, and I think that also shows that ESG is not a sprint, but a marathon. So so that's that's quite important. And then on on, on greenwashing, um, you see, I mean, there are examples in in I mean that example that I just gave from this that South African CEO could be seen as greenwashing. Because it's set targets and it's not anymore around, but uh, it's successful. We'll have to deal with that. But you you see certainly everywhere in the world, even in Europe, um, in, in even in big companies, uh, the greenwashing aspect. And I think we need to be quite cautious. And I feel that also in interactions with clients that say, if you set targets, it needs to be real targets, and it needs to be seen. And it needs to be validated also by the external community and society as real targets and as real things that we do good on the E and the S and the G. So I think that term greenwashing has trickled through, 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 throughout the different organizations. And I see much more um, transparency by, by senior decision makers by for doing the right thing instead of saying something and setting targets quickly. 
So I see, I see a material change in that based on the discussion with our clients. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I heard I recently heard a thing about leadership as well with sustainability and saying part of it is accepting that you have a broader responsibility outside your own company as well. Um, and that's hard for leaders often because they, you know, it's it's, it's their role in society almost to do it, yeah, which is tough. Anyone else want to add on on the greenwashing and the long-term nature of making sure that we really embed ESG into our business models? Yes, it can be uh, I think I'll touch a bit on uh, true collaboration across sectors. I think um, in terms of short-term and long-term, often we, we rush to look into what can be done immediately. But I think to um, Shamila's point, it's critical that we um, allow us to bring together, you know, best people and smartest technology. Um, this is the future now, but again, enabling us to tackle biggest challenges of today um, and capture the opportunities. I mean, we working with um, organizations such as the, the Oxfam, looking into the recyclers, which is now, but part of the future, what we've done is we supported the initiative by introducing a 100% recycled plastic sunlight dishwasher bottle, um, which create demands, but it's easily um, absorbed. So I think at the moment, it's critical for us um, to have those PPPs come alive and to be true to them. Because I feel like sometimes we come together as industry and public sector and speak on those huge um, topics. Um, I remember last year during COP, uh, we struggled in terms of what's our South African position when it comes to um, um, climate change now and in, in the future. And I think it's a call for us to be very intentional as private sector and, and, and private se public sector to sit and really have goals to say, for instance, um, from a Unilever perspective, we want to reduce, um, to collect and process more plastic than we sell by 2025. And this should be part of our, it is part of our strategy and part of the governance. But what is it that we're doing now? We looked into companies like your Pepsi Call. What are we doing together to really, um, you know, bring our efforts and resources and make sure that we come up with really big projects um, in the country? And I think the likes of the NBI sit at the center. They are the, the, the facilitators of these communication and they are responsible to make sure that the commitments that are made by private sector and public sector come to pass. We can have now now for the organizations to say, hey, we're doing this with the uh, recyclers, we're very excited, but how are we linking our organization strategies to the bigger picture of the South African strategy when it comes to ESG? Mm. Thank you, Shamila. Lisa Tembile, the, the issue of collaborative action is really that transformative thing in achieving the, uh, the objective of sustainable development, because it has been a focus on short-termism and individual profit and individual success that has driven business up to now, but has also created uh, the dislocations we've seen and the deficits we've seen in relation to responsibility for the environment, the protection of the commons, and things like that. And so now to reverse that is really the opposite that needs to happen. There's huge opportunity in collaborative action. Um, I mean, just a simple example, companies spend millions and millions of rand on CSI investment and often doing that in individual pockets to meet whatever they need. Just think about the collective opportunity of that money to shift the dial on key issues that we have. Um, and I think that is critical, is that collaborative action, but a better relationship with government as well, because this has to be about working together. The NBI has brilliant examples of really trying to work hard to enable that on the ground to drive impact. And I think that is at least a positive thing because, you know, once you see that it's possible, more and more hopefully you can do. I want to quickly, Wendy, touch on the issue of the greenwashing and the element of trust because they're very much integrated. So if anybody follows the Edelman Trust Barometer, you would have seen and Edelman really measures the level of trust that civil society has in each of business, NGOs, the media um, and government. And over time, there's been a deterioration in trust across the board. Um, but what we've seen in the last few years is the reversal of the trust in business. I know quite ironic, right? They trust business more. <laughs> but that's a good thing because the opportunity there is to be able to use that to say. And so and the expectation, honestly, is that business actually takes on a role in society that's perhaps even greater than its remit in the traditional sense. But it's saying you're kind of our last hope right now. 
We want to see leadership from you. And that is what we're starting to see. So the opportunity now is for business to translate that into tangible effort and the collective effort in the ecosystem, which is the bringing together of civil society organizations and the like, will almost hold you to account who are not, you know, there's not a vested interest necessarily and say, okay, these are the standards we should be working towards and that enable a greater good and business, we want to see that happen rather than maybe some of what we see is often the self-reporting of business, which of course is an inherent bias in many instances. So seeing the collective ecosystem work together to ensure credibility and to and to kind of mitigate the risk of greenwashing is critical. And so we need to recognize the importance of that ecosystem working together as business and to do our best to ensure that we use our resources to leverage that. Thank you so much. Totally, totally agree. Um, Ruth, you may have the last word on this topic. It's just a very quick one to say that, you know, this concern for greenwashing is actually driving a lot of regulatory activity, particularly in Europe. And that's important because if you are selling to anyone who is selling into a supply chain in Europe, then you will at some point fall under this new directive, which is about anti-greenwashing, which makes companies operating from Europe also responsible for anything that happens in their supply chain. It's also enabled a lot of civil society groups and others to bring complaints against companies with very long global supply chains to the courts to say you haven't taken care of these issues or you've made a claim which wasn't true. So the pressure is not just going to be about how to do it locally. It's going to come down your supply, down your buying chain to actually manage this risk because there's more and more, obviously, you know, emphasis being put on this by civil society and by NGOs. So just to say, you know, it's really worth looking at this and getting it right. And, and that is an opportunity for a discussion with your buyers and with your suppliers. Because this isn't a thing that you just decide in the middle of a value chain and say, oh, I'm going to do it. And it doesn't matter what's happening either side of you. Actually, the whole thing matters. And there's push on buyers to be supporting their suppliers to be compliant there. So that's also an opportunity. Right. And that whole collaboration, co-creation of new solutions um, really is becoming a, a, a norm these days as well, right? And, and a good a competitive advantage, ultimately. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're almost at the end of our time together. So I'm just going to give each of the panelists just two minute elevator pitch. You're talking to your board. You have to convince them why there's a business case for ESG. What do you say? David, <laughs> we'll put you in the hot seat. <laughs> I think I saw a question come up about uh, different generations. You know, when we <laughs> talk about investors and uh, we're going Gen X to millennials to zillennials and Gen Z and whatever the next one is. I think, you know, someone like Unilever and Sita might understand this as you get your, your equity and your uh, debt holders putting pressure on you from an ESG point of view. What are you doing in that space? And then you get your customers and your clients putting that pressure on you as well. They want to see certain levels of the expectations met. And I think within investing, it's a similar thing. Uh, if we don't evolve to offer sustainable style products that is what our clients want. I think that's pretty clear. That's kind of a business risk um, for somebody like ours. Uh, and maybe it doubles up with the previous question around greenwashing. We're seeing litigation in the EU, as Ruth mentioned, around greenwashing within financial services. People are putting ESG labels on products, which once you lift the lid on the tin, it doesn't do much in terms of ESG. So uh, it's about being authentic, um, delivering what you promise, um, yeah, and I think that's it offers quite an interesting intersection of you know financial services with what what the world uh, what clients want effectively. Thank you. Good. You want to go next? So yeah, in, from from my perspective, I would say, and it has already been men, men, men mentioned, I think, by David in the beginning in his opening comments around ESG as a financial benefit. There have been numerous studies, and of course there has been discussing around, discussions around the one study says A, the other study says B, but there have been a number of studies showing that uh, ESG has an impact on your profitability, on your shallow returns, and on your stability of your, of your performance. 
recently there was one from Bain and Company and Ecovedis, which was looking at private companies. I think it was coming out this week. And it shows that even their private companies with a good ESG performance are better companies. And it's in fact logic. If you do have good governance, if you have good social impact so that you can limit labor unrest, if you think about environmental and let's say, for instance, reducing your water usage, reducing your waste, using uh, renewable energy or new sources of energy with a low carbon footprint, it should come out in, in the picture to 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 have a better shareholder value value creation not only for for your shareholders but for all your stakeholders and we i mean the one q a was saying what happens with gen the generation the millenniums and so on a lot of millenniums and i had a debate with one of the clients when i said well, do you in esg can also retain talent and he said yeah in my business is not really necessary because they were talking about low-skilled people. But I said, and, and maybe this is because in the South African market, labor is in excess at this stage, low-skilled labor. But in, in, in other markets where you really need to have very well-educated people, high-skilled people, people have a choice to make and they choose for companies with a good ERG footprint. So that's also a reason to do it. It's not only on customers, it's not only on suppliers, but it's also on retaining the right talent for your business. And without the right talent, you will never have a good business in the end. Great, thank you. Samila? Wendy, in the interest of time, I'm going to simply put it like this. If I was in the boardroom, I'd we'll be able to say to somebody, if you don't invest in that future that you want, the one that you're going to get is going to be worth infinitely less. Very nicely put. Thank you. Can we quote you on that? <laughs> I think it's great. That's a really nice way of putting it. Um, yes, Wendy. I think um, I'll, I think it's very pivotal for organizations such as ours to take action through our brains and to improve the health and well-being of our people. Um, and as well as an advance, I mean, uh, Kat spoke on diversity and inclusion and equity in order to make the vision uh, a reality. ESG is more than just good intention. It's about creating tangible, practical um, plans that are achievable. Um, so success is not about climate change, diversity only, but it's about enabling our people tackle biggest issues of today and to capture opportunities for the youth for tomorrow. Thank you so much. Also really nicely put. Ruth, last but not least. Yes, I think I'm with Shamila on this. You know, many people say, but ESG, we can't afford to do ESG. And it always reminds me of that famous slogan that says, you think education is expensive, try ignorance. It means how many opportunities will you not have? How much more vulnerable will you be if you don't? So we can't afford to. My question is, can you afford not to? Because you still want to be here in 20 years. And without that investment, that's not a sure thing. Okay, so I think that brings us to the end. I just really want to thank all the panelists. You have been so great and so insightful and made my job extremely easy. I really appreciate you all. And I'm just going to hand over to Shannon to do the vote of thanks and close. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Wendy. And as you said, that does bring us to the end of our webinar. I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to you, Wendy, for enabling an engaging discussion. And thank you also to our panelists, David Levinson from Nedbank Investments, Sitimbelen Kobese from Unilever, Ruth Rennie from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, Kurt Ruland from Envision Advisory Services, and Shamila Subramani from NBI. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on the business case for ESG, which explored whether ESG factors can help companies achieve their business goals while also making a positive impact on society and the environment. The next ESG Africa Conference webinar takes place on the 17th of May and focuses on trade and ESG. Registration details for that webinar will be communicated soon. 
The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you so much for your time and goodbye.